It's the glory callings, the glory callings. And I'll give you verses in just a minute. In the days of the old South, an African-American slave and preacher had an infidel master. The master said to the slave one day, you are a preacher, Sam? Well, I tells about Jesus some, Master. Well, if you are a preacher, you ought to understand the Bible. Now tell me, what does this mean? And he opened the Bible and read, Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Words that have puzzled wiser heads than the poor slave. Well, said the slave, Master, where is it? It's in Romans, said the master. Oh, my dear master, I will explain this whole business to you. It is very simple. You begin with Matthew and do all the dear Lord tells you to do there. And then you go on to Mark and on to Luke and on to John. And when you get to that place, it's easy enough, but you can't begin there. In other words, instead of starting at Romans and predestination, start at the beginning, which is Matthew. I think the old slave was pretty wise, don't you? So we're going to start at the beginning of some things. I talked about glory for a couple of services. Now I want to talk about the calling of glory or the glory callings. The subject of glory is inexhaustible. There's so much to preach about there. But there are some simple things that we must get to first that we know well. And of course, one of the things that you know well is salvation. So we'll start with the calling of salvation, knowing that most of the congregation is saved as far as I know. But you've been saved a long time, and it's old hat to you. Can I tell you something about that? It's kind of dangerous to get lazy about salvation. It's kind of dangerous not to enjoy it like you used to. How many of you know that it used to be quite exciting, but it seems like now it has become more commonplace. By the way, we ought not to let salvation get too far away from us, should we? Shouldn't we glory in salvation? Amen? I think we ought to. So for all of us who have been born again for a long time, we need to never forget the basics. The Bible says in Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, but the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, meaning that we should not turn away from them, but remember the gifts and calling of God. And we ought to move on from those places to perfection. Now, there is the distinct possibility, and I wouldn't know, wouldn't have any idea, but there's always the distinct possibility that someone is thinking that they are a believer, but really not one. That's a possibility. And there's possibility that sometimes people get deceived into thinking that they are a believer. By the way, whether we know it or not, one of Satan's tactics is to deceive people. That's his main tactic. Would you not say amen? He deceives people. And sometimes even good people who think they're saved may simply be deceived by Satan. Well, I want you to know something. If a person thinks they're saved and they're really not, Satan's having a big time because he says they won't ever get saved because they already think they are saved. That's a good tactic of Satan, but it's a bad tactic, of course. We know that. But why would anyone want to even desire to be saved if they already think they are saved? So Satan does have a tactic of deception and he deceives many good people into thinking that they're saved. I talked to a fellow this past week, and uh, he says something like this. He said, I have been saved many times. <laughs> That's kind of sad, isn't it? And he says, I also smoke pot, and I also drink beer. And he said, and I believe in Jesus Christ, and I've been saved many times, but I also believe in karma. And the good and so on brings you good things. Well, I told him that he needed the Lord. Wouldn't you tell him that? And I say, you, you just need to, you know, 
come to church and get right back, get right with God. If he's not right with God, I don't think he is. Do you? And anyway, so I tried to encourage him a little bit. But uh, anyway, we'll pray for that fella. You know what they call him? They call him wild man. And he's like that for sure. But one way that one can be assured of their salvation, and this is one of the thoughts that I want to bring out tonight, where the callings of glory are the glory callings. One way that one can be assured of their salvation is the unadulterated love for other believers. Now, we're going to celebrate the love of God here in about a month. And so let me just say this. One of the things that you know and that I know has to be in the heart of a believer is the love of God. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed from death unto the, into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Now I know, I believe, I really do believe this, that you have the love of God in your heart. But here is the questions that we must ask ourselves. If there's any iota of a doubt, do I really have the love of God in my heart? Or does hatred reign there? There are telltale evidences that surface as hatred reigns in the heart. Jealousy and envy. Jealousy and envy are evidenced by gossip and ill will toward our fellow man. Do we love each other or are we jealous? Of each other? Are we envious of each other? Do we take behind the back verbal pot shots at others? I want to I want to I want to make that I want to say that plain and distinctly. Do we take behind the back verbal pot shots at others? That's a good indication that there's not a heart of love that there ought to be there. Suffice it to say, many professing Christians have the characteristic of a heart of hatred and not one of love. John the Apostle in his first letter writes much about the love of God. He also tells us about our deeds. Therefore, another way to tell that we have real salvation is not only the love of God in our heart, but what are our deeds like? Here's what he says in 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. There's that word, deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. So that doeth righteousness rings a big bell in my heart. Do we have righteous deeds? Doeth righteousness. What does doeth righteousness really mean? Well, someone said doeth righteousness means living an upright life. Matthew 7, 15 and so on. It says this, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. The men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles. Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit but a corrupt tree bringeth forth uh, evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore he that, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. So what are our deeds like? Are our deeds righteous deeds? So one thing you can know for sure about your salvation is that you have the love of God in your heart. Another thing that you can know and be assured of is if you have salvation is that you do righteous deeds. The things that you do are for God and not just for you. A ravening wolf, this passage states in Matthew, is like that something that ravages something or devours it. And when that beast like the wolf devours, it leaves only a little bit left behind, maybe a few bones and things like that. Maybe a little bit of meat, but not much. A ravening wolf is taking everything he can. And a person 
who is like that, a person who has deeds that take away instead of adding to, one with unrighteous deeds is always taking and never giving. Can I ask you, and may I ask myself, are our deeds righteous deeds? Giving and not taking. So that person who uses people up as a friend and throws them to the side, leaving nothing behind but an empty, hollow friendship that never was real at all. That person is like that wolf, just taking what they can get from somebody. Their friendship, maybe their admiration, maybe their, quote, love. It's not real love. But anything they can get from them emotionally, they desire it and eat it up. But they leave behind a hollow relationship that has nothing left. They are good friends for a while, but later there is absolutely no friendship at all to be seen. In fact, you would think that after a few months or years, there's not even a friendship that ever existed. Now, that's like that old wolf. He got all the admiration he wanted, got all the attention he wanted, got all the popularity he wanted. But in the end, that person that, that has been used is a shell. So seeking love like a wolf seeks flesh is a heart that is filled with hatred. Because a person who will use up a person has a heart of hatred, not a heart of love. What are our deeds? Are our deeds, righteous deeds, giving, loving, or are they unrighteous and always taking? A life that is taking always, a life that is always speaking ill of, is the life of hatred and unsalv not being saved. But if a believer lives a life of righteous living, he uplifts others by putting their interests above their own interests. Philippians 2, 3 says this, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. As I read that verse, I'm convicted always. And well, I might be because my old sinful nature doesn't like to put the other person's interest above my own. And neither does your old nature like to put the other person's interest above your own. But a person who habitually puts their interest first and the other interest last does not have the heart of love, has only a heart of hatred. So what are our deeds? Are our deeds really lifting people up, adding to that person, looking at their interest instead of our own interests? What are our deeds like? Loving other believers is putting that believer's interest above your own. Is that the way we live? Is that the way you live? Am I preaching to the choir? What, what, what's going on? Do we really have salvation? You say, preacher, you, you know that we're saved. I do. But I know sometimes that we fall into many traps the deceptions of the devil. So there are two ways that you can be assured of the calling of salvation. It's a glory calling. No doubt about it. It's a glory calling. But there's two ways, and there's more ways than this, these two. But here are two primary ways that you can know that you're saved. Number one, you have the love of God, not just a love that wants to um, get love back. The love of God doesn't want love back, even though it does happen. But the love of God loves purely because of love. God loves us when we were yet sinners, and he didn't expect anything back. He still loved us. That's God's love. 
It's unconditional love no matter what condition we're in. And we were sinners of all sorts, but he loved us anyway. Aren't you glad that God loves us? Unconditional, not expecting anything in return. But if your love is expecting a return love, that's not the love of God. I want that to sink in. If you love because you want to be loved, that's not the love of God. That's human love. Human love wants to be loved in return. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to try to make friends with every dog I come in contact with. Do you? I don't want any dog barking at me meanly. Do you, do you want to be bit? I don't want to be bit. I don't want dogs barking at me. I got a neighbor's dog, and I still had not made friends with him. His name is Apollo. And he's a male, and he's a dominant alpha, there's for sure. And uh, he won't have a whole lot doing, but he wags his tail and still barks. <laughs> so, and his owner comes out every now and now then and says, I don't know why he does that, but he's just so protective of the yard, et cetera, et cetera. And then Mrs. Carper was coming in, Ms. Seitler's, uh, out of Ms. Seitler's room. We went by to see her. Today's her birthday, by the way. She was 80, 85, 85 today. And uh, Ms. Carper, her sister-in-law, was coming out. And uh, that's Dr. Harold Seitler's daughter, uh, Ms. Carper, and that's Benny Carper's mom. And she's got a little toy something, what do you call those things, a terrier, and one of those little tot, tiny terriers, and he runs all around on a leash. And that little terrier was looking at me, didn't bark, and so I got down on the floor and I tried to get him to come to me. That little terrier wouldn't come to me at all. You know what? I wanted to love the little terrier so the terrier would love me. I didn't want to get bit. Of course, the terrier wasn't going to bite me. But you know what? We have animals, and we say, I love my animal because they love me, right? Is that right? But that's human love. Even a dog can love like that. But God's love says, I love you anyway. I love you unconditionally. So are we putting interests of others first? Do you love other believers? Do you lead an upright life with righteous deeds? Those are two ways that you can be assured of your salvation. We can use those two checks, and there are others, but we can use those two checks to see that we have salvation. Then there's another thought about salvation and the calling of salvation, and that is the Holy Spirit of God. Um, I think probably this is one of the best ones uh, that should be considered. We can't let it go unnoticed. The Bible says in Romans 8 9, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Do we have the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit's going to change our life and change our thinking. The Holy Spirit is going to help us to think like God thinks. The Holy Spirit is not going to lead us down the road to temptation. The Holy Spirit is going to lead us away from sin. Somebody say amen right there. The Holy Spirit is going to keep us from trying to fall into sin. We often hear the phrase sometimes about a person who really is committed to the cause that they love uh, maybe it's politics or maybe it's some other cause, but we say they've got a fire in the belly and they mean that that person has something stirring inside of them that makes them do whatever they're doing, their political cause or whatever the cause may be. He's got a fire in the belly. We say that about preachers sometimes. He's got a fire in the belly. We get uh, some of that from the old prophets who said they had a fire burning that they could not put it out, could not keep from speaking so one thing that I notice about believers is that they've got, quote, a fire in the belly. They want to share Christ. They just cannot, even though they might be timid about it, but they still want to share Christ and they want to try to share Christ somewhere else. You say, preacher, how do you know that? You take a person that's just been saved a month and I'll promise you they're trying to tell people about Jesus. 
And that's a good proof that they really got saved. Amen? So I've seen that in New Converse. But I'll tell you something about, quote, the old timers. Something seems to happen to that, quote, fire in the belly. Uh, that spirit of God that has a, a, a confession of Christ. That's what the spirit of God wants us to do. Confess Christ. Are we, are we totally trying to do that? Is that, a, is that a concern of ours? Do we really want to do it? I want you to know something. The people that I know that have been believers and have been what I call real true blue believers, they are the ones that say, at the drop of a hat, they say, come here, let, let me tell you about, let me, let me tell you something. And start speaking about Christ. Do you have that in you? Do you have that desire to tell somebody about Jesus Christ? No rebel will inherit the kingdom of God. Wow, I changed thoughts real quickly, didn't I? One who has the spirit of God will love the Bible. One who has the spirit of God will be submissive. And no rebel, an unsubmissive spirit will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I know that some of us are strong-willed. I know that. If, if, if there was a book written on strong-willed children, we would be the one in the book. Can I tell you something? That strong-willed child has to have his will broken, but not diminished or not taken away from him, but controlled. We call it broken. That doesn't mean it's taken away. It just means controlled. And so we say that child or that horse or whatever it is has to have that will broken. Has your will ever been broken by the Holy Spirit of God? Has it ever been submissive? I know folks that cannot for the life of them be submissive to authority. They have trouble with every single boss that they have. They have trouble with every single preacher that they know. Can I tell you something? Any person who has trouble with authority has an unsubmissive spirit. They're a rebel. Somebody say amen. And the Holy Spirit of God doesn't make rebels. The Holy Spirit of God makes submissive believers. Amen. So do we have the spirit of God the Spirit of God that has love, the Spirit of God that confesses Christ, the Spirit of God that is submissive and willing to work with a great spirit. No rebel will inherit the kingdom of God. Listen to this verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, uh, adulterers, nor, adulterers nor, fornic nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor coaches, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now you can put rebel in any one of those, but revilers is one of those words that has the idea of rebellion in it. You see, a rebel wants to rule over people. That's what a rebel wants. A rebel wants to rule over you. A rebel says, I'm your friend, but I'm going to tell you what to do. Can I tell you something? A rebel is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. There's no doubt about it. The Bible tells me that. You see, a rebel is not submissive to God. Does not have that spirit that God puts in their heart that makes them submissive. Now, I know that we've been raised in the South and we're called rebels many times. And sometimes we want to use that and act like uh, a rebel. Can I tell you something? I don't mind being called a rebel from the South because I'm from the South. But I'll tell you one thing I don't like, I'm not a rebel. I don't want to have a rebellious spirit. The Bible tells me that rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft, and I don't want it because the Holy Spirit doesn't want it in my heart and doesn't want it in my life. A rebellious spirit is not the spirit of God. A rebellious spirit says, I control you, and you don't control me. I'll tell you what to do, 
You don't tell me what to do. A rebellious spirit says, nobody tells me what to do. That's a rebel. What's in our heart? The spirit of God makes a submissive spirit. There is always in any message that I preach and any truth that I preach, by the way, I'm preaching to myself more than I preach to you, but anything that I preach, there's an Old Testament example. Gideon is such an example. He was led by the Spirit of God to liberate the Israelites from heathen lords. Once Gideon had won the miraculous victory with only 300 soldiers, the Israelites wanted to root him, Gideon, to rule over. They said, rule over us, Gideon. You're our champion. You won the battle. You defeated the enemy. Miraculously, 300 men, you did a wonderful, wonderful thing for Israel. Now you be our ruler. I'm paraphrasing the story. And here's what Gideon told those leaders of Israel. I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. I like Gideon's answer, don't you? You know what? We don't need lordship from others. We need Christ as our ruler. Somebody say amen. The Lord wants to rule over us. And we can't say, I'm the one in charge. The Lord is the one in charge. You see, when I say I'm the one that rules over and I'm the one that tells everybody what to do, you're taking God's place. That's a rebel. That's what Satan did. That's what Lucifer did before he was cast out of heaven. He was a rebel. He was the original rebel. The Spirit of God doesn't do that. No, the Spirit of God's not doing that. That's not the Spirit of God. If you have a rebellious spirit, it is not the spirit of God. No doubt about it. So I'm getting back to some fundamentals. I'm calling it glory callings. Salvation is one of them. We need to be reminded of the evidences of salvation. Do we really have salvation? Or do we just have now, I want you to be very, very attentive. A magical prayer. And we think we're saved because of a magical prayer. Can I tell you something? I don't care what you said when you said, quote, I accept Christ as my personal Savior. I don't care how you prayed. If it did not change your heart, you are not saved. A prayer doesn't change your heart. Submission to God is what changes our heart. Somebody say amen. Amen. Some people have just simply said, yes, Lord. But you know what some people do? They pray a magical prayer, and all the time they're saying, I'm going to do what I want to do. Basically, they're saying, Lord, please save me, but I'm going to do my own thing if you don't mind. And God says, you can't come to me that way. You're not, you're not getting salvation that way. It's a free gift, but you're not getting it with conditions. You can't put conditions on a free gift. Amen? Can't put conditions on a free gift. So the Spirit of God helps us be a submissive. Our nature wants to be a rebel, but the Spirit of God makes us submissive. How many of you have ever had the Spirit of God say, just be quiet. <laughs> Sometimes I want to pop off big time, man. I really want to let her roll. But I don't. You know who did that? The Spirit of God. Now you say, preacher, sometimes you do. Don't tell nobody. Okay? But every now and then I slip up. And you do too. But can I tell you something? It's the Spirit of God that says, just bite your tongue. Amen. You know, I told you about Wild Thing a while ago, didn't I? Well, here's the reason me and Wild Thing got to talking. He had a 
couple of fishing lines out and I didn't see them. And the wind was blowing and I threw my bait out and the wind blew it across his line. Oh, that's a no, that's a no, no for fishermen to get crossed up in somebody else's line. You just don't do that. Well, I didn't know I was crossing his line. I didn't see his line at all. And you say, preacher, you're making excuses. Honestly, I didn't see it. Well, he comes flying around and say, you write your line in my line. I mean, this is an ADD, I mean, big time ADD, pot smoking drinker. And uh, you, I said, man, I'll get it. I'll fix it. Don't worry about it. And so I, I got, I moved. And oh, wow, man, he's still over there doing his arm. Like, like this, you know. Got the whole cotton picking lake and you can fish right on top of me. I said, I'll pay you, man. In a minute, one of our friends came up. It's a black fella. And he was, I'm sure, telling. I know he did. I, don't, I didn't hear the conversation. He's on the other side of the lake. And uh, I could see him talking. He was talking to wild man. And I, my friend, the black fella, is a Christian. And he retired from the, one of the services. And I forgot which one. I think it was Navy, but I'm not positive. But anyway, he knows that I'm a preacher. Because we've talked about it and talked about the Lord a couple of times. And I'm sure that wild man was telling him, and I'm sure he said, that man's a preacher. Well, anyway, before that happened, wild man drove up to me in his little, he's got a lawnmower that he uh, hot rotted up a little bit. And he come flying over there in his lawnmower and I gave him $5 for his line. He said, I tore up. I didn't tear his line up. But anyway, I gave him five dollars, and he went off in a huff. Now that's half of it. I said, "That's all I got." So anyway, well, my black friend talked to him, and in a minute, here comes hot rod motor. I mean, he was motoring around there doing donuts in a in a Husqvarna ride mower, Jimmy. Husqvarna ride mower doing donuts, and he was hot. he had done something to make it run faster, and he come flying around there, and he drove up to me and said, "Had a wadded up five dollar bill." I said. I knew I shouldn't took this money from you. I said, no, you can have it. He said, I was wrong. I said, no, I was wrong. He said, well, we just call it a draw. I said, okay, that'd be fine. And I said, when you, are you saved? Do you know you've been, are you, so on. I started witnessing to him. Yeah, I've been saved many times, all that stuff I told you before. And so here, me and Wild Man, we made a friendship. But you know what I wanted to do when he started talking about me crossing up that line? I started saying, you shit, you shit, can't take the whole cotton picking lake yourself. I got a right to fish over here, don't I? You know, I could have said some stuff. How many of you know I could have said some stuff? Yeah, I could have really got on him big, big time. But you know what? The Holy Spirit said, shut up. Don't say nothing. Just fix the line and move. You know what? I fixed the line and moved because the Holy Spirit told me to. I wasn't afraid of wild man, but I'm afraid of the Holy Spirit. Right, is that right? Yeah, I was afraid of him. Can I tell you something? The Holy Spirit will keep your mouth shut. You say, well, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. Yeah, that's where you don't have much left. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so let's get off of that one. Let's get one more quickly. There is another calling of glory. This, this is so important. It's, it's simple. It's simple. We need to do like the old slave preacher. Go back to the beginning and start with the beginning and you get that right and the rest of it will come later. Let's start at the beginning. There, salvation is a beginning. But what about separation? Separation. You say... Preacher, now you know that your daddy and all them men back in the 50s and 60s, 70s, they preached that so much that people just hated it. They hate them. And now separation has gone out the window and nobody wants to talk about standards. Nobody wants to talk about separation any longer. Well, can I tell you something? We need to stop thinking about standards and start thinking about the biblical principle truth of separation. We should be separated from evil. Can I hear an amen? I mean, that's the simple truth. That's, that's not, a, that's not a, a rocket science. I mean, you know, the Bible's just plain. 
No doubt about it. It says this. Wherefore, this Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. In that scripture in Hebrews 12, 1, it has two things that we are to separate from or lay aside. One thing we're to lay aside is weights. That means it's not a sin. It's just something that hinders us from doing the will of God. So there are many things that hinder the believer from doing the will of God. Hobbies is one thing. I could let something like fishing hinder me from doing the will of God. You can let something that you do and you like hinder you from doing the will of God. Whatever hinders you from doing the will of God is your weight. Let us lay aside every weight that does so easily beset us. In other words, these little things that we like to do instead of God's will are the things that we are to lay aside. I worked at the A&P for years and uh, seven years to be exact in the early days of our marriage in the early days of my employment. But anyway, as many of you know that story. But in the meat market, there was uh, a meat locker and in the meat locker, there were hooks on rollers that went around a, a little trolley-like thing a rail, and when the trucks came in, the meat market guys would get in there with their aprons on, smocks and aprons, and they would grab those half of a cow or a quarter of a cow, I guess, quarter of a cow, and they would grab the hind quarters of the cow, and they would pick it up like this on their stomach and chest, and they would stumble into the meat locker, from the truck to the meat locker, and rear up and hook the legs right in between the ankle bones or somewhere in there and they would hook it on that uh, trolley thing on that hook up there and then spin it around and then they'd go get another one. Well, that hook was holding the weight. And so that idea of laying aside the weight has that which hooks you. So there are things that are hooking us, they are weights. It is something that is uh, hard to lay aside because we say, oh, it's not a sin. It may not be a sin, but if it keeps you from doing the will of God and it hinders somebody else from doing the will of God, it is going to be a sin. It is a weight for sure. Can you believe in this simple principle of separation? We have the simple calling of salvation, but we also have a simple calling of separation that you've heard all your life. Well, where did it go? Did it disappear from the Bible? No, it didn't. It didn't disappear from the Bible. So if a verse like this one in the Bible said, let us run the race with patience, it, it refers to the runner in a race running. Now you've been to track meets, I've been to track meets, and you've seen the runners run, and they have the lightest clothing on possible. Now back in those days, in the Greek days, had very little clothing on at all. But they, they wear very lightweight spikes for their shoes and uh, lightweight uh, shorts and shirts, and everything is as light as possible. They lay aside any heavy clothing, any heavy shoes, or anything like that. They lay it aside because they want to win the race. So we have this analogy of winning the race. They don't wear gaudy jewelry. Now, I'm not talking about whether jewelry is a sin or not a sin or whether we should lay aside our jewelry like some denominations have believed in the past. I'm just saying these runners in these races don't wear a whole 
neck full of necklaces. Do you know what? Now, I'm going to tell you a pet peeve. Can you hear a pet? You want to hear a pet peeve from, a, from me? When I see a baseball player with about three or four necklaces around his neck, and he every time he bats or every time he fills a ball or every time he pitches a ball, he has to tuck these necklaces down into his shirt. I think they ought to take every necklace off of every baseball player. Don't you? There's a, a shame and disgrace. You should never see that. Can I tell you something? I'm not preaching against necklaces. I'm just saying now they let all these ball players wear all kinds of stuff. It doesn't make any sense. In the past, it used to not be that way. But that's just my personal opinion. But let's look at some weights or hindrances as I close. A weight can be food. A weight can be hobbies. A weight can be work or other things that we like to do. There are golfers who golf all the time instead of never doing the Lord's work. There are fishermen who fish all the time instead of ever doing the Lord's work. There are shoppers who shop all the time instead of doing the Lord's work. There are people that have pets like horses, cats, and dogs, and they take care of them more than they do the Lord's work. There's another verse that says something like this. Philippians 4, 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. I'm going to finish with this story. And it's about a fisherman laying aside a weight. I knew this fella in Lawrence, and he loved to fish. And he was good at it. And he had a little boat. And he went out on Greenwood Lake almost every day. Almost every day. He even went out on Greenwood Lake on Sunday and missed church. Well, he got to go and change churches and ended up at Faith Baptist in Lawrence. And Daddy preached about doing things like that. Preached some of them old-fashioned methods, messages on separation that we don't hear anymore. And this fellow says, well, I can still go fishing on Sunday. It don't, it's not a sin. And so he took his little boat and he went down to Lake Greenwood one Sunday and he got up under a bridge and tied up. He's fishing for crappy and he tied up under the bridge and a storm came up. I don't know. I've been on the lake one time when a storm came up in a little old bitty aluminum boat and it scared the life out of me. The waves were just about to come into the boat and when we docked, the waves did come into the boat. But anyway, I don't like storms on the water. And the storm came up and he was tied up under that bridge and that boat was jumping up and down and bouncing off the pylons of the bridge And it scared this veteran fisherman to death. He said to the Lord, Lord, if you'll let me out of here, I'll never come back on Sunday. And sure enough, he got out of there, pulled his boat up on the trailer after the storm passed by, and never went back on Sunday. Did that stop him from boating on Sunday? Well, let me tell you what happened. I like creative people. My dad was creative. And you know what he did? Took a motorboat and put a loudspeaker on it, and they drove around Lake Greenwood, and they'd see a group over here, and they'd start preaching off the boat. You see, he still got to go to the lake, but he was preaching the gospel or part of it using the gospel man. You say, did anybody get saved from preaching the gospel on the Lake Greenwood? I never knew if anybody got saved. I was one of the passengers in the boat. But I'll tell you one thing for sure. The Holy Spirit changed somebody's life. He laid aside a weight and God gave him something else. Listening to preaching from a boat on Sunday on Lake Greenwood. That sounds like a different story to me. That's a whole lot different. You know, he laid aside one weight and the Lord gave him a blessing. Can I ask you this? Are you willing? I didn't even talk about sin sin in that that verse, but I'm just talking about weights. Are you willing 
to lay aside a weight and get a blessing. Let's pray.